Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little. Today we're going to be going through some hands from 1-3 No Limit that took place at the Stones Gambling Hall in Sacramento, California. I actually went out there to commentate their final table recently, and I got to play in a 2-5-10 game that was ridiculous. And this game we're about to watch is also ridiculous. It's kind of come to my attention that people love to gamble it up out at Stones Gambling Hall, as the name suggests. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through some of the hands that I think are interesting that illustrate points that you should either you know learn from or also points that you should make sure you do not do. So let's just take a look at the action right off the bat. There is a $10 straddle on the first hand. And this player, Harlan, with pocket twos under the gun plus one, has to decide if he should limp or if he should... Uh, fold or raise. Personally, I would have just folded, and I know that may sound a little bit crazy, but in a game like this that is generally wild, if you limp, you're very often going to get raised, and a raise is usually going to be to about 60 or $80, and then you're barely getting the right price to set mine, because notice you need to be getting about 10 to 1 at least to set mine, and if someone makes it 80, well, you have to put in 70 more to win maybe 855, so it's just barely better than break-even implied odds. If it gets limped around, that's obviously great. But I think you're going to find that in general, in straddle pots, people typically play somewhat aggressively. So keeping that in mind, I would just fold. If I am going to play this hand, I probably would have raised it to $35 or so, three times the straddle, plus a little bit. But he does limp. And it is what it is. Hijack with queen nine offsuit decides to limp this player here. And now Azan has ace four offsuit on the button. And I think this is a pretty easy fold. And the reason I think this is a pretty easy fold, as we discussed earlier in the PowerPoint, is that if you raise this hand, as he does, he makes it 50, uh, $61. I think what's going to happen is very often everyone's going to call you. And that's bad when you have a hand that flops very poorly, as ace four does. If he had a hand like ace-jack or ace-queen or maybe pocket tens or better, I would be on board for raising. I think it'd be fine. If you are going to raise this ace-4 offsuit, I would definitely make it bigger because really, what is your goal with raising ace-4? Well, you're trying to either get it heads up or get your opponents to fold. The problem, though, is that whenever you make it 61, as he does, it's $51 more to call. And I think most people are going to call, especially... If the initial limper calls, the other player is going to call, then you're playing ace four three ways, and that's just really where you don't want to be. So I would have just folded this. I don't even think you need to limp in with it, even though you are on the button. The problem with ace four is that it is severely dominated, and you really do not want to be severely dominated. So he does raise to 61, and now the player in the straddle elects to call no problem with king 10 offsuit. Again, another very big flaw here. Out of position, king-10 offsuit facing a six big blind raise, effectively. You just have to fold. King-10 offsuit is a terrible hand. Remember, we mentioned that a lot of players in these games call way too often preflop with all sorts of stuff, anything they deem to be anywhere near reasonable. And that's exactly what Gina is doing. She's calling with king-10 offsuit because she probably thinks king-10 is reasonable. And once she calls, I mean, I can just pretty much guarantee everyone else is going to call. I don't possibly see how anyone is going to do anything else. Um, I mean, if you do limp with the deuces, you might as well call the preflop raise. I don't think it's that bad anymore to call, because now we are going to see the pot very multi-way, which makes us way more likely to get paid off. So he's counting out his money. It's this player here. I don't think this is Harlan, actually. I think this is someone different. Or no, that, that was that was Frank. My apologies. Okay, anyway. Flop comes Queen-10-3, which is a pretty fun flop. It gives Frank Queen-9 for top pair, and also Gina a 10 for middle pair. So it checks around to Ozzy. Azan is his real name. Commentators are calling him Ozzy. Um, he decides to bet. And... I don't really care how much he bet here. I think it's almost certainly going to be a mistake. And the reason I think it's a mistake is because on a board like this, no one is ever folding a queen or a 10 or a flush draw. 
or a straight draw, or a good straight draw at least, king, jack, or jack, nine. And if you think about the ranges that most of these players are going to be limping and then calling a raise with, it's going to be a lot of pairs, which you're not really worried about. Also hands like connected cards, like 9-8, but also big cards, like, well, as we see here, queen, nine, and king, ten, right? And these hands are almost certainly not going to fold. I mean, I would be pretty shocked if they folded. So if we were heads up, I could be on board for stabbing one time. But the problem is these against three players. And someone's going to have something the majority of the time. So if Azan bets the flop with the ace four, it's almost like he has to keep bluffing. The problem is, is that he has just no equity at all and no draws at all. So this is a hand just to give up. And I do want to make it clear. I think Azan is probably thought to be the best player in the game. And this is almost like typical 510 no limit hold'em strategy where you raise over limpers with a wide range and then you play the pot heads up in position, right? I mean, that's fine. But whenever you are going to see the flop very multi-way against wide ranges where you're really gonna have a tough time knowing when you should be bluffing or not, and really four ways you should be bluffing very often, this is, this is definitely a mistake and it's certainly burning money. Unless this is like the only bluff in his range and I don't know why he would pick a random ace-4 offsuit to be the only bluff in his range. So here we see Gina sticking around with king-10. This is another example of what I was mentioning in the PowerPoint, because a lot of players stick around too often post-flop. And in this scenario, she is first to act after Azan bets. So that means that if Harlan or Frank has anything, presumably whatever they have is going to be better than king-10, right? Like a queen is better than king-10, and no one's going to fold a queen. So I actually think Gina should just fold here. I know that sounds a little bit nitty, but notice that a heart is really hard for her to continue on. Also, someone could just have a queen, which is pretty miserable for, for miserable for her. Also, someone could just have king queen and she can be almost dead. So I would just fold here. Whenever you are out of position against multiple players and effectively two players in the middle have not acted yet because they checked almost in the dark or they will likely check in the dark to the preflop razor you can't really continue in the spot too confidently. So I think you just need to fold. So, gets back around to the queen nine. And I, kind of similarly to the king 10 call, I actually think queen nine should at least consider folding. Now, you should be way more inclined to fold top pair not closing the action as opposed to I'm sorry, middle pair not closing the action as opposed to top pair closing the action. But this queen nine really only beats draws and tens. And the problem is that this is a wild game, right? And I think all the players of this game know that it is a wild game. And because it's a wild game, everyone kind of is aware that everyone else is playing a little bit too loosely and in a splashy manner, right? So given that's the case, I don't mind the call with queen nine. So the next question is, should, should queen nine go all in? Notice he only has $654. If he calls, the pot's going to balloon up to 700, right? So once he calls, he's got 500 left. So it's less than a pot size shove. I actually think that that would be the best play to shove. Understanding that when you're beat, you're going to get called every time and you're going to lose every time. However, there a lot of hands that your opponents are going to have have equity. Like right here. He's actually in great shape with top pair against an under pair and ace high. But even then, he only has 61% equity, right? So if he can jam and make both these players fold, he wins this whole pot 100% of the time. Whereas if he calls, these players are going to realize their equity 40% of the time. And the pot's going to go up to 700, but he only owns 60% of that. So I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but 60% uh, of 700 is way less than uh, 548, right? Of course, that's not quite how it works because whenever you jam in your beat, you get called and you lose. But I do think this is probably a spot to shove the queen nine and pick up your equity. And also you're still gonna get called by draws and who knows, maybe the king 10 still calls. Um, let's see what he does. I really don't think any play here is a mistake. I want to make that clear that like folding's acceptable, calling's acceptable, shoving's acceptable. So it turns a nine of hearts, which is pretty interesting, right? If you remember back to how I mentioned people typically overplay hands, queen nine may get overplayed here. Um, 
So Gina actually goes all in. All right, well, <laughs> I thought the queen nine may overplay, but it turns out the king 10 drastically overplayed. Here, the king 10 is effectively turning itself into a bluff. So why bluff with king 10? Is a queen ever going to fold? Well, the queens that are reasonable for someone to call a $10 straddle and then call a $50 raise are going to be ace queen, king queen, queen jack, queen 10, queen nine. Probably not queen eight. So if someone has a queen, it either has top pair, top kicker, two pair, or a straight draw of some sort, and it could just easily have a heart with it, right? And those hands just aren't going to fold. If someone has a 10, well, you actually beat all the 10s that are not two pair or ace 10, so we're not really concerned with that. And if someone has a flush, they're obviously never going to fold. So I think this is a particularly bad all-in from Gina. Also notice that she's shoving for a little bit more than the size of the pot into Azan, and if Azan just has one of those hands, he's not going to fold, and... Gina's putting her money in drawing quite thin. So I think this is a particularly bad play from Gina. I don't really know why she is doing this. I guess I should make it clear before we even move forward that people do play games for various reasons. Everyone is not actually playing to try to win money. I think a lot of people get in their heads that, yeah, I'm going to play poker to try to win. But no, they're playing to gamble. And I don't know anything about Gina. Maybe she is a hardcore gamer or something like this, but... This play seems like she is just coming here to gamble. And so far, all these players' plays seems like they're coming here to gamble as opposed to try to actually win money. And there's nothing wrong with going to play and to gamble, assuming you don't care about money. But presumably, you all are my students and we're trying to actually win money from poker. So playing for fun and to gamble is not a legitimate reason to play. So at least for us. But for other people, it's certainly fine. So anyway, um, Frank facing the shove. So in a typical game... Should Frank fold this? I typically don't fold here. The only reason to fold is because there's still a player yet to act. And it's tough because a player yet to act, Azan, could just have aces with the ace of hearts. I mean, he raised preflop and then bet the flop into three people. He'd have to think he has something. Just so it turns out he has stone garbage. <laughs> but that's the only reason you should consider folding. If this was heads up, I think you just have to shrug your shoulders and call. Even if against a good player, if you're, he's against a good player who is going to have a balanced range of flushes and then probably pairs plus draws, so just good straight draws and good flush draws, I think you still have to call it off just because the queen nine is quite a strong hand. Um, but given, I think these players kind of know the other players are willing to gamble, that should make you even more inclined to call here. So let's see what he does. I definitely do not like this whole obvious mannerism show. He stands up, puts his hand in his pocket like, man, what do I do? All right, I guess I call. And just like that, they're all in. Obviously, the result does not matter. I don't know who wins or who loses. And it doesn't even matter who wins or who loses. Oh, they're going to give it to Gina for fun. That's nice. So Gina wins a nice pot, but in terms of errors in that hand, there were a lot. I mean, the preflop limp with twos, the limp behind with king. I mean, literally, if you think about through this, almost every single play I'm not a fan of in this hand. Um, the queen nine offsuit should either raise or fold and almost certainly fold. The ace four offsuit should definitely not raise. The king 10 should not have called. The only play that was good here was Frank's play after the flop, calling the flop bet, although I said he even should jam, and then uh, not folding on the turn. And this is a very good example of a standard wild game where people are just really, really, really splashing around way more so than you would typically expect competent players to splash around. All right, for this next hand, we have a... $9 straddle, I believe, as we can see, one, three, looks like nine. And now Azan in the hijack raises to 30 with king five of clubs. <sighs> Similarly to the ace forehand, I would probably just fold this one, mainly because Azan is not in great position. He has to worry about the players yet to act coming along. So I would just fold this. Um, folds around to Gina. And this is an interesting spot that we should certainly discuss due to the straddle. If the game is played such that other people are straddling and you do not have to straddle and you're not straddling, 
then it's basically like you just get to play gigantic blinds without paying the blinds, right? Imagine it's two, it's, imagine it's one, three, ten every time, but you only have to play four dollars or pay four dollars per orbit. You can actually play really, really, really tightly because it doesn't cost you any money, at least in proportion to what everyone else is doing. So a very good strategy for that game is just play really tight. So what should Gina do with this king-queen offsuit? Well, if we're playing a normal game, this is a pretty nice spot to 3-bet. And the reason you want to consider 3-betting is because you want to price out the big blind, or in this case, the straddle. And also because that is going to make Azan fold out a lot of his hands that have a pretty good amount of equity against you. And when he does have a hand like ace-queen or maybe even ace-king, he'll just call you. And then if he misses the flop, very often he's going to fold to a bet or two. The problem with calling is that now if Gina misses the flop, very often what's going to happen is she's going to check, Azan's going to bet, she's going to fold. Or maybe she calls one time and then he barrels her off on a later street. So by re-raising, obviously you do play bigger pots against the hands that beat you, but you also steal the pot way more often. So I think I would definitely 3-bet here. And notice here, if she, if she just makes it 100, Azan's going to fold and that's going to be the end of the pot and she'll pick it up. So let's actually see what happens. She does decide to call. And now Jake, the $9 straddle, calls with 9-8 of diamonds in the big blind, which I actually think is fine. The main reason I think it's fine is because he's closing the action and he's going to be three ways. I also think Jake could three bet as well. Given what we've seen from Gina so far, she seems to be pretty splashy. And also, Azan seems to be opening way more than his fair share of hands. So 9 of Diamonds is certainly a candidate to 3-bet. And the times you want to be 3-betting it are when the raise is so big to where you are somewhat priced out from calling. And I don't think it is here, but it's close. I guess I should make it also clear that I have skipped a hand or two whenever not a whole lot happened. I want to give you all the most action hands. <laughs> all right, so here the flop comes. Jack, 8-3, and Azan again decides to bet. Looks like he bets 30 or so. If he's going to bet, he should bet small, but I really dislike betting into these players. This is another good example of a situation that I mentioned in the PowerPoint earlier of where, what do these players do wrong, right? Well, they give too much action. They call too much. So if they call too much, what should your adjustment be? Well, your, should, your adjustment should be to just stop bluffing. And so far, Azan has bluffed pre-flop and on the flop in this hand and the previous hand. And I think both are just completely unnecessary. Now, Gina should probably fold, but she decides to call. And that's quite splashy. The only reason to call would be if this was heads up and you are also facing a small bet. But we are not heads up and, you know, the bet was small. But then... Uh, the hand's just not very good. You're going to have a hard time realizing equity, unless you're going to check raise on a lot of turns. But again, these players are too splashy. They stick around, they do not fold, and because of that, that should lead us on to not bluff too often. Now, I understand that a lot of people, especially as they move up in stakes, start winning at poker because their opponents fold a little bit too often. And therefore, aggression is often what you see in the higher stakes games because a lot of people don't defend quite as frequently as they should. These players... And in many small stakes games, the players defend way more often than they should. And that leads to situations like this, where you're betting king five, but your opponent's calling with king queen three ways. And are you really going to be able to bluff two people now? It's just not practical. All right, so he bets 35, Gina calls. I do think Jacob should call here. He has middle pair and a backdoor flush draw and a backdoor straight draw. This is a fine hand to call. I think Jacob's played this hand perfectly fine so far. And I would just check again if I was Jacob. So the turn checks through, and the only real question here is, should uh, Azan bet again on the turn? And I would just say no. I mean, the problem with betting the flop is that, again, you have no equity. If you're going to be bluffing on the flop, you want to have stuff like king five of spades. Like, if he had king five of spades instead of king five of clubs, I could have been on board. Or king five of diamonds or king five of hearts. Because those hands all have backdoor flush draws. Like, notice here, if he had the king three of spades, he could keep bluffing. But now... Given he has the clubs, there are just no bluff cards for him. And when there are no bluff cards, that really makes your bluffs very, very unattractive, especially multi-way. So anyway, he checks through. We get to the river, deuce of clubs. Should Gina lead with king-queen? Well, the problem with this is that Jake, Jacob, could so easily have a jack that's just not going to fold. He would have certainly check called the flop. He would have certainly checked the turn. 
So you can not discount a jack from his range. What would he do with a three? Well, he definitely checked the flop. He would probably call a flop bet. I don't really see him folding three ways facing a small bet. On the turn, he would definitely check to a Zahn again, I imagine. So he could also have a three. So for those reasons, I don't think this is a great spot for Gina to bluff. Once Gina checks, I think Jacob has an easy check. There's no point in value betting, and obviously you're not bluffing. So Jacob would have an easy check. All right. Should a Zahn bet? Ooh, this is a close one because now you have to assume both opponents would have bet if they had a three. So if they have, if they don't have a three, it means they either have a jack or an eight. Well, a lot of people in small stakes games just bet with their jacks on the river as well, even though I don't necessarily think that's a good bet because if you bet, what's really going to call you? So if they are betting with all their jacks, it means they both have an eight or worse or a busted draw. So you actually beat the busted draws for the most part. You do lose to random ace highs. <sighs> the problem is you check back the turn. I guess you could check back the turn with your jacks. And maybe even stuff like queens if you feel inclined. So you know what? I think Azan should actually bluff with this. I don't know if it would work or not. Because Jacob may just find a call. But this seems like a pretty reasonable spot to bet 120. Just like you're trying to get value from a jack that you check behind on the turn. Uh, the main time you don't want to bluff here is when you think your opponents would check with all their jacks on the turn, or you think they will call with all of their eights. If either of those things are true, you should probably not bluff. And that's kind of where poker gets tough, because you don't really know with any real degree of certainty if these players are going to call or fold in this spot with their with an eight, and also you don't know if they would always bet with a jack. But I think a lot of players in small stakes always bet the jack or the three on the river. So maybe it's maybe it's a pretty good spot to bluff because then they're somewhat capped at maybe pocket tens and worse. And you'll at least put those hands in a bad spot if you bet 125. Now, if you know for a fact they have pocket tens or worse, because you know they always bet the river with their aces and with their uh, jacks and eights and I'm sorry, their jacks and their threes, then you should maybe consider betting big because then you put them in a worse spot. Some people just will find a hero call for the... Uh-oh, my video just reset. That's unfortunate. Um, some people will just call every single time in those spots. Let me go back and rewind the video and we'll find it. So, yeah, if you think the opponents have jacks in the range, you should probably give up in Azan shoes. If you think they do not have jacks in the range, because they would have bet them, then I think you have a pretty easy bluff. But... He just checks it down, and Jacob wins the pot. I think Jacob played that hand great. That's exactly what I would have done there. Again, Gina, a little bit too splashy, and Azan, a little bit too aggressive. So here we have a pretty interesting spot where Azan opens from under the gun plus two with King Jack of Clubs to 35. And again, it was a $10 straddle from Frank in the uh, under the gun seat. And I think raising King Jacks of Clubs is perfectly fine. The suited big cards are almost always fine to open for most positions, even in a very splashy game, just because they realize their equity decently well, because you often flop either top pair or a draw or over cards, right? You always have something. So I like the raise. Harlan, on the button, decides to call with 4-3 offsuit. And you should virtually never call here before a three offsuit. The times you can perhaps justify calling are when you're incredibly deep. Like say we're playing $3,000 deep at 1-3, one, not 1-3-10, one, but at 1-3. So we're playing 1,000 big blinds deep. We're in position and we know our opponent's going to be very weak. That's a time you can consider calling. But even then, I would virtually never call here. One in maybe 1,000 times, <laughs> maybe. And that's when my chips accidentally fall in the pot. So don't do that. Now, Frank in the big blind, or I'm sorry, the straddle, does something that a lot of people do when they do straddle, and that is that they way over defend it. Their logic is that I put out my straddle, like I have to defend my straddle. I mean, it's only 20 bucks more, but that is a huge, huge, huge mistake. It's exactly as when you're playing regular poker with no straddle and you're in the big blind facing a three big blind raise. You're not calling with 5-3 offsuit, right? And here, there's no reason to call with the 5-3 offsuit. Um, I mean, perhaps these players would all call the three big blind raise with their 5-3 offsuit because, oh, it's only three big blinds. I'll call with anything. 
But that is not good logic, and that's going to cost these players a lot of money in the long run. So do not call with garbage here, even when you do straddle. You do not have to defend your straddle or protect your straddle or anything like that. So flop comes ace-king-8. Um, five, uh, the 5-3 offsuit checks, as obviously it will. Azan decides to check with the king, and I think this is just good. Um, if you're checking here with your marginal made hands, which I definitely think you should consider in most spots, uh, this is a very clear marginal made hand, right? You lose to any ace, and you're, uh, almost everything else is drawing dead against you. So this is a pretty nice spot to check. If you do check and Harlan bets, I think you have a pretty easy call. And you can stick around again on a lot of turns, especially if you think your opponent's overly aggressive. Um, and then if it checks you on the flop and Frank bets the turn in the river, you can probably find a call as well. So this is a, a good example of what you should do, where you should just check your medium strength made hands. I discuss this a lot in my book, Mastering Small Stakes and No Limit Hold'em. Hopefully you've checked that out already. And we discuss the reasons for checking with this hand. So checks around to Harlan, who decides to bet. And how do we feel about this bet? He bets $80 into the $109 pot. I think this is, well, completely unnecessary, given Harlan has no hand, no draw, right? With no hand, no draw, checking and giving up is almost always the right play. But when Azan checks... Harlan probably assumes that he has either a marginal made hand or garbage, which may be true. And if that's true, it's very important for Azan to structure his checking range so that he has some hands he can check call with on the flop and then check fold on the turn, but also some hands he can check call with on the flop, check call on the turn, and then check fold on the river, but then also hands he can check call the flop, check call the turn, and check call the river. So Azan needs to be very aware that he needs to have some aces in his range here that he's basically never folding. And my plan here would be to check call flop, check call turn, check fold river most of the time. So that's what I would do. And then I would just have some aces in my range to where you can't get pushed around. Now, what a lot of people do by mistake, or because they haven't thought about their strategy, is they check with only kings and a king and worse here in Azan's shoes. And then they check call the flop, and then either check fold the turn and check or check fold the river. And what happens is they end up check folding out their whole range by the river unless they improve the two pair, which just isn't going to happen very much. So by taking that line with only your medium strength hands, you're really exploitable because all your opponents have to do is bet. And remember, we are playing a game where we know people like to bet. So if we know people like to bet, we should structure our range even more so to where we can call down. So we should maybe even put some reasonable aces in our range so that we're really weighted towards aces and can very easily call down against our opponents. So anyway, Harlan bets. Azan does call. Harlan, actually, sorry. Azan gets a terrible turn. And the reason I say this is a terrible turn is because now he loses to any eight and he's still losing to any ace and now he's chopping with any king. So if Harlan was betting with king nine or something like that, well, Azan now chops. Oh, man. Pretty pretty much no matter what Harlan bets, if it's any reasonable amount, I think Azan should actually just fold. This is one of the few really bad turns for him. Remember, I've said he's going to check call on almost all turns. Well, the turn you're not going to call on is an ace. I'm sorry, an eight. An ace is fine. Because on an ace, you were behind the ace to start with. Your opponent could still have worse kings that you beat. They could also have an eight, and they could also have random gut shots and whatnot. Um, here, the only draws you realistically beat that should be betting are gut shots. The queen-jack, queen-ten, and jack-ten. And now maybe backdoor spade draws of some sort, like ten, well, ten-seven of spades or something like that they decided to bluff. But you really just don't beat a lot here. So I, I think Azan probably should check fold here. But the important thing to note from this hand is that Azan needs to be very aware of his range. Because if his range is only kings and worse, then he's going to end up folding basically all of his range. And notice he does just snap check fold. And he, he gives Harlan the pot. Um, this is something that I believe Ed Miller talks about in his book, Poker's 1%, where basically the premise of the book is that if you just bet on all three streets when your opponents check, you're usually going to win the pot to the point where it's profitable. And I think that's actually very true in a lot of small and medium stakes games because a lot of people will call on the flop and or the turn 
very often, but then play really straightforwardly on the river. And if you can get your opponents to just call the flop in the turn and then fold on the river, you're just going to print money, right? Because they're giving you their flop and their turn bets, which is way more profitable than just picking it up on the flop because then you only get the pre-flop bet. So Harlan just uses blind aggression and it works. And I know I called this game wild, but notice we notice Harlan is playing wild. But if you find that your opponents just play too tightly when facing multiple barrels, that can be a very potent strategy in small stakes games.